Walking down Devon Avenue today is a multicultural treat, from Pakistani storefronts to Indian restaurants and even some Mexican supermarkets. There is everything to find here. However, had you walked past Devon Avenue 30 years ago, you would have found one of the biggest Jewish community epicenters in all of Chicago. When Chicago music venues closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic last March, many owners feared this meant their stages had played their last show. And this has happened all over the country in cities all over the country. Chicago is very special though. I will say that um, the rest of the world really looks at Chicago as an independent music hub, you know, just not, not only because of the music that comes out of here, but because of our independent venue ecosystem. Chris Bauman, owner of Patio Theater in Avondale Music Hall, knew that unless direct support was provided, nearly 90% of Chicago's independent music venues would not survive months with zero revenue. When you have these huge venues, uh, you know, we've got huge tax bills. We've got huge um, expenses that are associated that did not stop. Seeking a solution to this long-term inactivity due to the pandemic, Chris co-founded the National Independent Venue Association, or NEVA, who alongside the Chicago Independent Venue League turned to their only remaining lifeline, federal assistance. Banks don't want to work with us because we've had no revenue, right? The only access we've had uh, and help is in we, the only people that can help us is the government. Neva successfully lobbied Congress to pass the so-called Save Our Stages Act in December, allocating $15 billion from the latest COVID relief bill to go specifically to shuttered music venues across the country. This bill will especially help Chicago, as it is home to more than 15 independently owned music venues who look to these funds as their only option to reopen in the future. We shocked a lot of people that we were able to, with no political experience, uh, with no, no knowledge of, of how politics work in that crazy world, uh, we were able to just, out of pure passion and, quite frankly, survival, come together and uh, to get that built. The funds from the Save Our Stages Act are still unavailable. But once they are distributed, Chicago music venues might finally have their long-awaited encore. I'm Luis Mejia, Loyola News Chicago. Thanks, Sarah. That's right. There has been an eviction moratorium across the city of Chicago for the last year or so. However, although we thought that that might come to an end soon, Governor Pritzker announced that this moratorium will be extended until May 17th. Rogers Park actually does hold some symbols and monuments commemorating the extensive Native American history and presence in the neighborhood. However, they're hard to find. For instance, right behind this electrical transformer here, you see a plaque put there by the Rogers Park Historical Society commemorating the original boundary line set between settlers and explorers and the local natives of the area. With the U.S. still busy in the fight against COVID-19, other medical procedures are now placed a second priority. Of these, blood donations have been hit the hardest, causing a shortage of blood and plasma across the country. The need for blood is ongoing. Um, every two seconds, somebody in the United States needs a transfusion. Since the pandemic, things have gotten even tighter for us. Dr. David Mayer is the chief medical officer at the American Red Cross. The organization is responsible for nearly 40% of the country's blood supply, with approximately 3.6 million units of whole blood and red blood cells collected each year. However, Dr. Mayer worries this shortage may cause problems in the future. One of the biggest issues we get concerned about probably around the holidays is being prepared for that d disastrous uh, event that unfortunately may occur where the blood needs would be dramatically uh, needed very, very rapidly. To promote blood donations, the Red Cross is adhering to strict public health guidelines, screening temperatures and enforcing social distancing, urging all potential candidates to become blood donors despite the pandemic. I'm Luis Mejia, Loyola News Chicago. Lakeside neighborhoods like Rogers Park have some of the most direct access to Lake Michigan in all of Chicago. However, meteorologists warn that if current climate patterns and drastic weather continue like they have now, some of these beaches might too be lost to erosion. Loyola University has confirmed that every single student planning to return out to campus this fall must be vaccinated. Universities like DePaul or Northwestern still haven't confirmed if a vaccine will be needed for their in-person activities. Reporting from Loyola University, I'm Luis Mejia. Across the United States, statues and monuments symbolizing some of the country's more problematic history are being met with heavy criticism. 
Statues like those of Confederate generals and other figures have even been removed from public spaces, with critics citing their racist and offensive background. Northern cities like Chicago don't have to worry much about statues of Confederate figures, but groups are claiming there's still much to be done. Behind me is a statue of former President Abraham Lincoln in Grand Park here in Chicago. Illinois is considered the land of Lincoln, with countless statues, symbols, and streets bearing the former president's name. But this statue is one of 50 statues and monuments across the city facing heavy scrutiny. The problematic nature of his policies on the, um, the, the removal, expulsion, and genocide of indigenous peoples in this nation stands side by side with being credited as, as the great emancipator. Bonnie MacDonald is a co-chair of the Chicago Monuments Project, a citywide effort to grapple with the often unacknowledged or forgotten history associated with the city's countless symbols. The project was started by the city as a response to the removal of a Columbus statue in Grand Park following last summer's George Floyd protests, and it hopes to help Chicagoans recognize the more problematic aspects of the city's history. Oftentimes this history has gone intentionally untold or it's part of uh, systemic racism to, uh, to disinvest or you know, prevent investment in these places that would tell a more complete history about Chicago and beyond. The monuments highlighted by this project are all over the city, including plaques of Marquette and Joliet on the Dusable Bridge to the statue of Benjamin Franklin in Lincoln Park. But the Chicago Monuments Project doesn't see the removal of these statues as their goal, but rather to help the city reconcile with their potential harm and symbolism. The Chicago Monuments Project is now accepting feedback from any of their monuments on their site from now until the end of April. You can find a full list of all the nearly 50 monuments across Chicago on their website. Reporting from Grand Park here in Chicago, I'm Luis Mejia.